she always like does something if I ask her? How she takes us places. Uh, she's a great mom. That she's fun and all. Um, I love that she always uh, makes sure that me and my siblings have as much fun as we possibly can. How she cooks meal, meals for us and takes us some, uh, to a lot of places and how she does a lot of stuff for us. I think mom's superpower would definitely be cooking. Invisibility? To turn invisible. To be doing everything in the world. <laughs> Love. Hmm. I don't know. My mom's favorite thing to do is probably uh, hanging outside with me and my siblings and my dad. Spend time with us. I don't know. Maybe just sit down. Um, I think my mom probably cleans the house and, um, like, gets everything ready for whenever I come back. Does laundry. Maybe just go somewhere with my daddy. Kiss my dad. Everything. So she doesn't give up and keeps on going. That she always does stuff for all of us. Um, because she just like, she's always there for me. Everything. Because, uh, she's really helpful with me a lot. The, the best room ever. Like, flowers and the world's squishiest bed. Ten teddy bears. Or actually pigs. A million dollar stuffy. Mm, giant stuffy. A hundred dollars. A brand new car. Um, I think I'd give my mom, like, I think I would plan a big party for my mom and use the million dollars. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, and I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, and I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mommy. Oh, come on. Let's say it together. Happy Mother's Day. Yeah. You heard from just a few of them. We had to edit out a lot, uh, but uh, <laughs> you heard from a few there this morning. Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, all of you that are watching us online today. Hi, I'm Gary, my wife, Rose, and we're glad to have you here as a part of one of many of our Discover Life uh, services here on the weekend. If I haven't got to meet you, I'd certainly love to uh, get to meet you, hear your story, and thanks again for coming and sharing this wonderful day with us. You know, I, before we get into the message, I wanted to share something about Mother's Day. We have the opportunity to celebrate mothers, and I know that in this room today, we've got a wide variety of mothers of all ages, young mothers, we've got grandmothers, great-grandmothers, we may even have some great-great-grandmothers in the room today. You know, I have the privilege for one more year to celebrate Mother's Day with my mother. I'll do that this afternoon. I already got her some flowers, and my Rose bought her some candy, and and some cards we'll give her and just spend some time with her. She's 89 years old, uh, soon to be 90. Rose and I are her primary caregivers. Um, so we spend a lot of time with her. Uh, even though it has some challenges, and, and as does everything in life, it's also very rewarding. And uh, I'm glad that I have one more year to do that as well. You know, I, I, uh, this morning I was thinking about what would be a really cute quote to share this morning. And so I went online, as uh, all spiritual people do, look for uh, quotes from Mother. And I read dozens of them. And uh, it's like, nah, nothing really stuck. And I uh, read some stories and different things. And so I decided just to write a poem for moms this morning. Is that okay? Here we go. Roses are red. All good poems start with rose.
When you're on, you're on. Okay. <laughs> Roses are red, violets are blue. We all have a mother who really loves you. There are many things that she gave us while we were learning and growing and getting into stuff. She gave us a hug and wiped away our tears when we fell off our bike when we had no fear. She gave us a scolding when we disobeyed or when we disrespected the love that she gave. She also provided so many, many things that we needed so much, but we never said thanks. We grew through the years so quick and so fast, she couldn't believe that our childhood didn't last. As we started our lives with our own families, she continued to love us unconditionally. Yes, I know she made some mistakes, because I've made them too, and so have you. But when it comes down to loving you so much, there's nothing like a mother's touch. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Today we're continuing our series on uh, name dropping. And Pastor Chad set it up last week with uh, God revealing to, Ab to Moses that I am who I am. And today we're going to begin to look at what are the covenant names of God. And each one of these is really a standalone message in itself because it real reveals a covenant promise uh, from God. You see, there's, there's probably no compound name of God more celebrated, known, and referenced than the one we're dealing with today and we've already sang about today, and that name is Jehovah Jireh. Say it with me, Jehovah Jireh. And when God uses a compound name all throughout the Bible, he's usually addressing a situation in life. Something is going on in someone's life or circumstance that God wants to reveal himself through that circumstance. You may have heard that Jehovah Jireh means my provider, and that is correct. But the meaning is much deeper than that. See, Jehovah Jireh is interpreted from the original text. And by the way, that's not the original Hebrew. That's just the English version of what we use, Jehovah Jireh. From the original text, it's, it's translated Jehovah will see it, or Jehovah will provide, or Jehovah will be seen. For God is seen to be seen is to provide. Our own English word provide is Latin for to see. So have you ever heard someone say, well, see to the matter? You ever heard that? Or I'll, I'll see to it. Well, that's, that's the inference here with Jehovah Jireh. Our Heavenly Father sees our need and with divine foresight of love prepares the supply. He sees to a need to supply it. And in the seeing, he is seen, or he reveals himself, or he manifests himself through providing. See, God is not a, something I want you to understand, though. When we talk about God, Jehovah Jireh, being our provider, he's not a spiritual vending machine. You need to understand that. The, the same God who reveals himself as our provider said in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. So, so there's a balance in that God's not a spiritual vending machine that we just go up and say, oh, Jesus, I need, I'm, I'm overdue on this balance, I need this. No, 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 it's, it's much deeper than that. God supplies what you need to accomplish his will in your life. And let's read a story together to get a clear understanding of what's happening where God first reveals himself as Jehovah Jireh. It's found in Genesis 22, 14 verses, but we need to catch the story, and here it is. Now, it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Everybody say tested. And said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I'll tell you. That's tough. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split the wood for the burnt offering and he arose and he went to the place of which God had told him. And then on the third day, everybody say third day, because that's important. We're going to look at that in a minute. Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. It took him three days to walk there. So Abraham said to his young men, the two that went with him, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we, everybody say we, we will come back to you. That's very important. 
So Abraham took the wood, the burnt offering, and he laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac, now he's probably a teenager at this time, much like the boys, young men that were standing up here a minute ago. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, son. He said, Look, the fire, the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? I mean, he knew, he knew how offerings were. He knew you had to have a lamb. Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. And then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there, and he placed the wood in order, and he bound his son Isaac, and he laid him on the altar on the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand with a knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And then Abraham lifted up his eyes and he looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And so Abraham went and looked, took the ram, offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. In verse 14, and Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, or Jehovah Jireh, in the original text, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Holy Spirit, I pray over the next few minutes that you will speak life to every one of us here today. May we, our eyes be open to your word and to life and to the revelation of your word as how it applies to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, all of the covenant names of God reveal to us what's available to us as children. But we have to position ourselves for that. It's not an automatic. We have to be in a position to receive that promise from God. And it's received primarily by faith. Let's look at Abraham's experience and how Abraham got to the point where God revealed himself as Jehovah Jireh. First of all, everybody say test. I had you to repeat that earlier today, tested. Verse 1, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And he said to Abraham, here, him, here am I. This was a test. When God reveals himself to you and I, it's usually because we're going through something. It's a test, a challenge, a difficulty, a problem, a disaster, a tragedy. Something on a level that gets our attention. We don't know what to do. God said, I want you to give the most precious thing you have. See, God had promised that he would make Abraham a great nation. And Isaac was his dream, his only son. And for him to ask Abraham to sacrifice him did not make sense. How could God make a great nation out of a dead boy? See, here's the thing we need to learn. When you're going through something that doesn't make sense, just hang in there because God's about to reveal his name to you. Don't, don't run. Hang in there. It may not make sense, but hang in there. See, faced with the choice of blessing or the blesser, Abraham made the right choice. Because, see, Isaac was the blessing, but God was the blesser. Sometimes we get so attached to the blessing that we miss out on the blesser. We get so enamored with the blessings of God that we miss out on the one that gave us the blessings. There's a story that you tell children about a goose that laid a golden egg. Anybody ever read that story? Well, if I had the goose here today and a golden egg, which one would you pick? If you're smart, you'd pick the goose because he keeps on laying eggs every day. You get one golden egg, that's it. But that's, and that's where people live many times. They're so focused on the blessing that they forget the blesser is more important than the blessing. Blessings come and go, but the blesser is eternal. Amen. And so what God is doing here, he's, he's also he's testing Abraham to see if Abraham recognizes what's most valuable to him, his relationship with Isaac or his relationship with God. God's putting Abraham in a situation that only God could fix. It's when you see a situation that only God can fix, then run to God, not from God. Don't blame God, bless God. Don't curse God, praise God. So I don't know why God let this happen to me. Stop. Stop in that moment and run to the Father. The first thing is a test. And I could spend literally days, I'm, I'm actually writing a book on tests right now, but literally days on tests. I face everything in life that comes my way I consider it a test. I don't, is it an attack from the devil? Is it, is it a test? It didn't matter. It's a test. And am I going to pass it? And a test does two things. It reveals what you know and what you can do and what you don't know and what you can't do. The first thing in moving toward 
knowing God deeper is passing tests. The second thing is in verse 3, it's immediate obedience. Say that with me, immediate obedience. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and the two took two of his young men and Isaac his son, split the wood for the burnt offering, arose and went to the place where God told him. Okay. Immediately, it was the next morning. He didn't scream and cry and fuss. He didn't tell his wife, good thing, she wouldn't have let him go. He, he just got up and obeyed. Delayed obedience is disobedience. See, there's two main things that God wants and he desires from us. Two main things. Are you ready? Number one, to be believed. Number two, to be obeyed. That's it. You believe God and obey God, you're going to be in good shape. Those are the two main things that God wants from us. Every second you procrastinate from doing what you know God wants you to do is a second for doubt to grow and faith to go. Every second you delay from doing what God wants you to do is a second your flesh will increase in strength and your spirit will decrease in strength. Every second you delay from doing what God wants you to do is a second for your destiny to be delayed. Delayed obedience is disobedience. If you know God wants you to do something, do it. Well, I'm going to, you're disobeying. Well, I, when I get in this situation, well, no, you're disobeying. If, God, if, you, if you read the Word of God and you see something that the Lord is speaking to you, the Holy Spirit's saying to do this, and you don't do it, it's disobedient. It's just flat out disobedient. Well, I mean to. Mean to doesn't mean anything. Doing to means something. In fact, James makes it very clear in the book of James that faith without works is dead. He didn't say it was sick. He didn't say it was puny. He didn't say it was weak. He said it was dead. And if it's dead, it's dead. I mean, there's no life in it. So when, when, we, when we hear something from God and, and we're reading the Bible, you're in a mess sermon like this and, 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 and the Holy Spirit enlightens something to you and says, hey, you need to start doing this or you need to stop doing this or you need to incorporate, you need to obey this in my word. If you say, well, let me pray about it. You don't need to pray about it when you know God wants you to do it. Secondly, if you say, well, I, I'm, I'm thinking about it, then that's immediate disobedience in life. Abraham didn't wait two days, three days, four days. Immediately the next day, Abraham responded. He did it, and he did it then, immediately. Here's the third thing. Verse 4, then on the third day, everybody say third day. Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. The third thing is continued obedience. Say it with me, continued obedience. So what do you mean? It took him three days to walk there. What do you think's going on in his mind for three days? I mean, it'd just be one thing if, the, if, if, if they got in the car and went there and in 30 minutes they were at the place and jumped out. And there, but three days he had to walk with his son beside him. Three days he had to sit down and eat with his son. Three days they built a campfire of a night and sat around and told stories and giggled and laughed. And all of his mind knowing that he's going to put his son on a, on, a, on a wooden offering. He's going to pull a knife out and kill his son because God said, I want you to offer him. Three days he had to go through that. Three, three days. And he's still walking toward that place. Any given point in time, he could have detoured. Any given point in time, he could have bought a lamb from somebody on the way and taken it and sacrificed it and went back home and nobody would have known anything about what was going on except God and Abraham. Three days. What, what are your three days? Maybe you're going through something right now. It's like, I, you know, I, I said yes to the Lord. I'm going to do this, God, but it's been a week. It's been a month. It's been 10 years that I've been doing this. I've been obeying God. and I'll be, Then good, you're in good sh shape. Just keep on doing it. But you see, it's a continued obedience, and that's part of the test. It's not about starting good. It's about finishing good. A lot of people can start, but not many finish. A lot of people, in, preachers in ministry, uh, businessmen, businesswomen, moms, dads, life itself, husbands, wives, Starting good's one thing, but finishing, man, you got to go through some stuff to finish. You, you got to go through some stuff when you're in continued obedience because between the obedience and, and the prize, there's going to be a problem. It's called the devil, it's called the flesh, it's called the appetite, it's called pride of life. All those things come into play. We got to deal with them. 
Well, I, I know, I know, I promise, but I, it just, it's just too hard. I've been doing this for three months now, and it's just, it's just too, too hard. Do you think it was going to be easy? Things going to be easy? See, one, one of the things that that we have to learn in life is that not everything's easy. Some things you got to die to. You got to press through. You you, you got to do that. You, you, you got to give up stuff sometimes. You, you got you got to lay stuff on the altar. Continued obedience. I, I remember I used this story when we came to Cape, thirty soon be thirty three years ago, because we had a good church. In fact, that church was larger than this church at that time, and it was in a little rural town. But we attendance wise, it was much larger than this church, and a brand new built two brand new buildings, and they had everything going good. But the Lord impressed on us that he wanted us, he had released us from there. And uh, when we came here, the, the, the night that the church, I, I preached and the church voted on us. First time I've ever been voted on in my life. <laughs> when you pioneer a church, you don't get, I mean, there's nobody there to vote. Just you and your wife, you start. And they voted on us. And I was sitting there thinking, that was my dream. That was my Isaac. And my thinking was that God was testing me. That was my mindset, that God was testing me. And so I, I, I came as in response to obedience to God. I didn't come here and preach because I wanted to come here to pastor. I came here to preach and to try out because I was taking a step in the direction of what I knew the Lord wanted me to do. There were over 90 resumes sent to this church. Ours was the last one. They'd already elected one pastor. He, he accepted it, and two days later called him back and said, no, God said you're not supposed to take that church. And so they had to start over again. They were weary. It was tough. And I recognized that, and I didn't want to make it worse, but I was also obeying God, Rosa and I were. And so we came, in, and, and, and I'm sitting in the pastor's office, and they're voting, and I'm still sitting there, my wife and, and two daughters, I'm still sitting there thinking, okay, when is the angel going to walk in and say, I'm just testing you? I'm serious. That's what was going on in my mind with these deacons sitting there looking at me. All of them many years older than me. I was 35. That was the youngest age that they would take a resume on. I didn't know any of that because I didn't send the resume anyway. <laughs> Rose sent the resume. I was in Venezuela doing a conference and she sent the resume to them. I didn't know it sent one until I got a call one Sunday night, Reverend Brothers. Uh, we have your resume. Who are you? <laughs> Where? Kate, I didn't send your resume. Well, we have your resume. <laughs> Rose is sitting there. Did you send him a resume? Uh huh. <laughs> yes, sir. But as I sat there and, the, and, and, the, and the, the deacon walked in the room there, the board member, he says, well, you, you, you won the vote. Are you going to take it? <laughs> That's exactly what he did. <laughs> uh, and I'm looking around and I'm waiting. I'm giving the angel of the Lord enough time <laughs> to get through. I know that, that I know that there's warfare going on in heaven, like Daniel when he prayed. You know, it was 21 days, and Michael had to come. So I figure Michael's wrapping up the battle. I'm waiting on the angel of the Lord to come and speak to me. I'm just testing. Say no. I'm just testing you. My oldest daughter in the 10th grade is sitting there crying. Daddy, don't make us come to this place. <laughs> it's true. Daddy, please don't make us come here in front of all of them. I'm the angel now. <laughs> the angel didn't come. The angel didn't come. And I knew that I had to sacrifice my dream there. So you got to understand, there's times, there's times in that third three-day thing, you, you, you may have to suffer some stuff. You may have to give up some stuff. You may have to walk away from something you love for something that God loves and do what he says because he, it's his, it's not yours. This, this is where Abraham had to keep his eyes on the blesser, not the blessing. The moment the blessing is more important to you and I than the blesser, it becomes God. It is an idol. 
And if I had walked away that night and says, no, I'm, I'm not doing, then I would have walked back to an idol. And I would have been an idol worshiper instead of a pastor. So, ooh, that's harsh. It's real. That's why many people never experience Jehovah Jireh. Are you with me here today? I know it's Mother's Day. I should be nicer. <laughs> See, one of the simplest yet most difficult principles in life is that life is a process. See, we all want to jump up and declare that God is my provider without passing any test or going through any challenges or pushing through any pain or putting up with anything uncomfortable. See, if you want to have victory in your life, you're going to have to roll up your spiritual sleeves, put on the armor of God, believe until you know it, pray until you're through it, stand until you've done it, and walk off the field with of adversity with the winner's trophy. Third day. Here's the fourth thing. Verse 7 and 8, but Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, son. He said, look, we got fire, we got wood. Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said this in verse 8, my son God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. The fourth thing is faith declared. Say it with me. Faith declared. Abraham declared that God would provide before he saw God provide. He told those two servants of his, he said, we're going to go up there and worship and we are coming back. So Abraham either had the mindset that God's going to do something different or when I kill him and I burn him up, God's going to recreate him, bring him back from the dead and we're going to walk back. Either way, we are coming back. You see, we. Before Abraham ever heard God say, don't hurt your son, before he saw the ram in the bushes, he declared faith that God would provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is not waiting until God does something, but believing before you see something. Abraham trusted God through the process. God, I'm not going through the process till you figure everything out and you work everything out and show me. Then there's no faith at all in that at all. It takes faith to follow God. Hebrews says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. I'm not talking about being presumptuous and doing dumb things. I'm talking about having a word from the Lord and following the word from the Lord in your life. Abraham trusted God through the process. And here's the last thing. Verse 12, and he said, do not lay your hand on the lad, nor do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. The last thing is that God responds. Charles A. Spurgeon, the great preacher of old one time, shared this in a message. It's an excerpt from a poem. I don't know if he wrote it or someone else, but here's what he said. Just in the last distressing hour, the Lord displays delivering power. The mount of danger is the place where we shall see surprising grace. See, what many people fail to recognize is that this story is not just about God revealing his covenant name of Jehovah Jireh to Abraham. But it's about revealing that God saw the need for mankind for a savior and had a plan to provide salvation for all mankind. Because only a few hundred yards possibly from that spot was another mount called Calvary. And Jesus took his only son and put it there because Abraham was willing to take his son to that place. It was in John chapter 8 that Jesus was debating with the Pharisees that said in John 8, 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. How, how, how did Abraham see his day? How did Abraham hundreds of 400 or so years previously see the day of Jesus? He lifted up his eyes because Mount Moriah is in view of Mount Calvary. And just as Isaac was put on the altar 2,000 years ago, Jesus was put on the altar for us. Just like Isaac was given back to his father, Jesus was given back to his father in heaven. You see, God sees our need today. In Matthew 6, 32, Jesus said, For your heavenly Father knows that you need all things. And in verse 33, he gives us the key to receiving all things that we need. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. All these things. That's it. That's the key to Jehovah Jireh. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. One of the things we have to understand, 
And this is why so many people live a superficial relationship with God, is they don't want to have to step out in faith and believe God. They, well, they live a case sarah sarah life. Whatever will be, will be. Well, if it's the Lord's will, if it's the Lord's will, well, if it's the Lord's will, you know it's the Lord's will that all should be saved. How many of you know that not everybody's saved? All you got to do is watch the news and know that. But it's the Lord's will. Why isn't everybody being saved? Because not everybody's believing on the Lord. Because the Bible says, whoever, whoever, whomever believes on the Lord will be saved. He didn't say those who were predestined. He didn't say those who were specially picked. He said, whoever, whoever in the slums of Bombay, now it's called Mumbai, India, whoever in the high rises of New York City, whoever on the streets of Paris today or Barcelona, whoever in the jungles of the Amazon, Whoever in the islands of the Pacific, in Asia, whoever, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, wherever they are, will be saved. Why? Because God is a covenant God. He is Jehovah Jireh. He will provide whatever we need. And he'll provide for you.